Hi, welcome back to the Global Agriculture Innovation Forum, hosted by Purdue University and supported by USDA's Foreign Agricultural Service. I'm Gerald Shively, Associate Dean and Director of International Programs in the College of Agriculture at Purdue. If you are joining us for the first time, I'd like to welcome you to the forum and encourage you to explore the Socio app and the networking features it provides. We've had more than 1,000 registrants from more than 90 countries, and the list continues to grow. So please reach out and network with colleagues around the globe who share your interests. This is the third installment of what will be a number of events we are organizing throughout the year on the theme of agricultural innovation. Today, we welcome to the stage a group of distinguished colleagues who will be speaking on the topic of promoting sustainable and climate smart agriculture. Our moderator for today's forum is Dr. Adam Chambers, air quality scientist for the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service National Air Quality and Atmospheric Change Team. Enjoy the program and please stay for the live question and answer session that will follow the presentations. If you have a question for the panel, please enter it using the Q&A feature in Zoom. Thank you and enjoy the program. Good afternoon and good evening. My name is Adam Chambers. I work for the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Natural Resource Conservation Service in the United States. Welcome to you, our audience from around the planet. Our audience represents more than 1,500 registered attendees from more than 100 countries. On behalf of the organizers, the panelists, I would like to extend a warm welcome to today's event. This is the Global Agriculture Innovation Forum. The Farms and Farmers of the Future uh, event focused on ensuring farms are sustainable and climate smart into the future. I'd like to step aside for one moment and wish you the best of health and safety during this COVID times. I uh, wish you all health, the best in health and safety. Um, and, and I'm looking forward to our event. The, uh, there is a special thanks that I would like to give. I'd like to give a thanks to Purdue University and a special thanks to Professor Shively uh, for, for the event. Uh, in the introduction, Professor Peter Hurst and Ms. Carol Braun. And as I contemplated our discussion today, I was excited about the opportunity to present and have this uh, a Zoom uh, meeting, if you might. Um, it's second best to us all being together in the same room. Um, I hope that you will join me and allow me to indulge. Uh, I would like to give a special thanks to the Purdue team. And I'm, I, I thought there, the one thing missing from this platform is the ability to, uh, to give praise and applause. So I found an app for that. There is an app for that. And I would like to uh, give a virtual expression of appreciation on behalf of all of us. I hope that came through. And now I'd like to get on to our, uh, our event and set the stage. Today's panel of extremely dedicated visionaries. We have, we have a, uh, the word that came to mind in, in preparing for this is visionaries. They imagine the world in, it's even better than it is today a world that is more regenerative in agriculture, a world that adapts to a changing climate, a world where a productive and equitable global agricultural system support a growing population under this overarching threat of global climate change, a world that supports working lands agricultural systems, helps agriculture mitigate greenhouse gas emissions, and adapt to the inevitable changes of global climate change. Our panelists, to borrow some words from Gandhi, the panelists are being the change they want to see in this world. So let's just get on with today's panel. Today's event will consist of four uh, prepared presentations that 
will be followed by a 30 minute live question and answer. And we're fortunate to have all of our panelists. They have submitted their pre recorded presentations. I will moderate through those pre recorded presentations. And then we will come back together as a live group and we'll have a, a, a robust question and answer time frame. On the panel today, we have Dr. Rob Bertram from USAID. He'll start us off. Rob's title, the title of Rob's presentation is Resilient Agriculture Systems. Rob is the chief scientist at USAID's Bureau for Resilience and Food Security, where he serves as senior advisor on agriculture and nutrition in the implementation of global food security. Then we'll move to presentation two, which is soil quality and health. That's the title of it. Dr. Ratan Lal, the distinguished university professor of soil science at, uh, at the Dr. Ratan Lal Management and Sequestration Center at Ohio State University. It's a pleasure to have Rob. It's a pleasure to have Ratan. Our, then we will move to adapting agriculture systems to the effects of climate change. And this is Dr. ML Yat in, in India. And he's the principal scientist and systems agronomist and sustainable intensification strategy leader at the International Maize and Wheat Improvement Center based, as I said, in India. And then batting forth here, wrapping us up, will be the integrated crop and livestock systems as a climate smart strategy for food security. And this is gonna come from, to us from Brazil. And that's Paulo Carvalho. And he's the discipline lead in the grazing ecology research group at the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul in Brazil. So we have a very esteemed panel today. And um, what I'd like to do is I'd like to take uh, this time to introduce Rob in more detail. Then I'll go, I'll come back to you after Rob's presentation and I'll introduce you to Ratan in just a little bit of additional detail. So Rob is the chief scientist at USAID's Bureau of Resilience and Food Security, where he serves senior advisor on agriculture and nutrition in the implementation of the Global Food Security Act. In this role, he leads USAID's evidence-based efforts to advance research, technology, and implementation in support of the US government's global hunger and food security initiative called Feed the Future. Rob coordinates the Bureau for Food Security Research Portfolio, spanning the US University Feed the Future Innovation Labs, the CGIAR, and other international agriculture research centers. He works on public-private partnerships in biotechnology, all of which collaborate and build the capacity with partner countries and organizations throughout the world. Doctor, we're very fortunate to have Dr. Bertram here. His academic background is in plant breeding and genetics, including degrees from the University of California at Davis, University of Minnesota, and the University of Maryland. Rob has also studied international affairs at Georgetown University and was a visiting scientist at Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri. And with that, I would like to turn over our first presentation to Rob. Greetings, everyone. My name is Rob Bertram. I'm the chief scientist in the US Agency for International Development's Bureau for Resilience and Food Security. And I'm just delighted to be part of this Global Agriculture Innovation Forum and very grateful to Purdue University uh, for inviting me here to join you today and to be with such great company and Dr. Ratan Lal. Um, I think my topic is going to be about what we call resilient agricultural systems. Um, this is where everything has to come together. Uh, I hope that I'm going to be able to share with you what we've learned in over 10 years of work in the US government's global food security initiative, Feed the Future. And I hope I'll be able to um, leave you with a sense that we must act in a climate challenge world in ways that finally end and reduce and end 
extreme poverty and hunger and malnutrition, but also that we can do it. And I hope I can leave you with a sense of optimism about the future. So today I will be talking to you about resilient agricultural systems and how they can deliver on uh, nutrition and poverty reduction goals that are at the heart of the Global Food Security Act. That's the, the uh, law that was passed um, under President Obama, reauthorized under President Trump, and which continues to guide our work. But also, I'm going to be talking about what it means to do this in a climate-challenged world. So let's start with the ultimate goal, and that is to end once and for all the scourge of undernutrition. And this is a map that shows you the extent of child stunting which is the marker for chronic food insecurity. And this, this means that these children, 20% of the world's children, will not achieve their full physical stature, but tragically, neither will they achieve their full cognitive potential. So this is a terrible human cost. It's also an economic cost. So this is a smart investment as well as a, a, a humane and compassion and and, and, and very strategic investment. And then if we think about where stunting is concentrated, it's also the exact same areas where uh, uh, extreme poverty is concentrated and where micronutrient deficiencies, vitamin A deficiencies, iron deficiency anemia, where these other things that inhibit human potential and, and cause suffering are located. The thing that you might not realize is that the burden of both child stunting and extreme poverty is concentrated in the rural areas and it's concentrated in rural areas that are the main agricultural production systems because that's where the great human population is concentrated. Now, why agriculture? Why should we be investing in agriculture? Well, first of all, we know that the poor are concentrated in rural areas, but Recent evidence shows us that agricultural growth, in other words, how we can increase the productivity and efficiency of the agricultural system from farm to fork, uh, will, uh, can, is up to four times more effective at reducing poverty. Uh, and that's at the left side of the graph. And, and what it shows is that in the very low income countries, agriculture is incredibly effective because it drives demand for locally produced goods and services. So the effects of agriculture are felt all the way across the economy, not just by farmers, not just by consumers having more affordable and better food, but also through the multiplier effects of these impacts of, uh, on, on human incomes and well-being. So here's another slide that tells you a great story about uh, what's happened in the world. Uh, and this is all part of a, a great global narrative. But what you can see here is that population has skyrocketed since the 1960s. And that's the middle blue line. And, and agricultural production has more than kept pace. And what does that mean? That means that productivity has been going up so fast that real prices for food have been declining. And the poorer you are, the more of your meager income you spend on food. So this has been a hugely uh, 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 poverty reducing, economic inclusive economic growth driver, especially in the developing countries. The other great hidden story here is that tan line at the bottom of the graph that shows you that this has all been done with very little expansion of land. So it's a tremendous story of human ingenuity and potentially um, real environmental and climate resilience wins. Now, one of the points I'd like to make today is that at the end of the day, what happens in these major agroecologies where hundreds of millions of small farm families make their livings uh, and in these same areas where poverty and undernutrition concentrate, it's going to be the availability of better tools and better information uh, that give farmer and farmers and farming communities more choices. 
And that's why we're excited about digital tools as well, because they can convey information. We're excited about scaling and partnerships with the private sector. And Purdue University has been our lead thought partner in this whole area for many, many years. And we're very grateful for that. So it's a combination of science and information that provide demand-driven solutions that affect all these domains on the right side of the graph. So we have three basic approaches that we can use in this context, these pathways. One is the ecological, and we can think about things like soil fertility improvements, water use efficiency. And I know Dr. Lau will have a lot more to say about this. Then we have genetic approaches in both crops and livestock, really exciting things happening, and I'll mention a few. And finally, social approaches, especially the empowerment of women, uh, but, but finding ways to uh, increase the efficiency of communication, democratization of information that, that in, helps farmers know what prices are, better weather forecasts, all kinds of things that reduce risk and increase uh, incentivized investment. So this is an example of how we've mapped our work in Eastern and Southern Africa to various impacts that you can see. And what this does is that red line in the middle, this is called a spider diagram. It shows you the conventional approach that was used in these, these major, major maize-based systems in Eastern and Southern Africa, supporting hundreds of millions of people and food security for whole regions. And then you see what happens when you bring in conservation agriculture and into the piece, into the picture. And you can see much greater uh, in increases in efficiency. We can also integrate an, uh, an additional legume crop. And, and we can, through all these changes, we can see uh, tripling in, in uh, the yields of legumes, a doubling of profitability, doubling of returns to labor, uh, hugely increased water use efficiency, reduced erosion vulnerability, we can see big nutrition gains from, from the integration of livestock, uh, gender uh, gains by virtue of uh, women saving time in labor in, in terms of weeding, and uh, nutrition gains uh, from the availability of nutritious legumes. So it's really a, a terrific story of how uh, uh, technology, information, and, and, and context in terms of markets and, 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 and uh, social capital all come together to deliver. So when we think about what happens in something like this, I think transformation is still a stepwise process. So if we're, this is drawing on information out of our work in the Sahelian zone in West Africa. And we can see that the first step forward is to increase, improve agronomy and soil fertility. And then we can start to manage water better. We can do diversification. And we can go from a situation where farmers are getting less than one ton of cereal per hectare to then one and a half to two tons, and then up all the way up to three to four tons of maize by in, in more and more uh, uh, in investment of capital, reduction of risk, and what this does is this provides people options and some people continue to invest in agriculture and other people step out into those new economic opportunities, perhaps in a, a supply chain business, in a, uh, uh, a shop that sells uh, anything from uh, implements to uh, food. But all of this is about the economic driver of what we see through stepwise incremental change that leads to real transformation. Now in Ethiopia, we, we saw this happen in an area that had had severe uh, uh, mining of the soil and nutrients. And again, it was a prescription of, for poverty and child stunting and degraded environment. So what we brought in was the, and this was a partnership with US universities, the International Fertilizer Development Center and the CGIR and USDA. And we brought in better fer fertility and soil management fertilizer quality improvements, and we were able to greatly increase uh, the response from fertilizer, but also reduce waste of fertilizer, reduce the leaching into the groundwater, 
uh, and, and basically tell a wonderful story that reduced uh, emissions intensity. So in other words, it was a climate smart approach. It increased water use efficiency tremendously. And in, eventually it was uh, transformative in the lives of those whole communities. So what do we need to do going forward in a climate challenged world? You can see that climate change, scarcity for, of water and nutrients, diseases, all of these are going to take a toll going forward. But we have, and we have to drive uh, uh, gains, and we can, this is the next part of my message is that we can keep up with the challenge of climate change, because we want to avoid land conversion, uh, cutting down of forests, draining of wetlands, we want to preserve those fragile areas and intensify in sustainable ways production in those major zones where the people are already concentrated and where we have a more resilient system. And all of this, remember, helps drive diversification as well. So what are the climate change threats we're concerned about? Here are quickly a list of those. And please do note that it's not just what we call abiotic stresses, things like heat and cold, but also pests and diseases are affected by climate change. So here's just a, a graph to show you how fast the new techniques we have allow us to make gains using genetic improvement. This is a story where just in the space of about seven years, tropical white maize, which was not of interest to the private sector, these new approaches to breeding that made things rapidly advance allowed us to go from less than five and a half tons per hectare to seven tons per hectare. This is a preferred type of maize in lowland trap, tropical Americas. And, and this gain, you can see finally at the end of the day, outperforms the best commercial checks. So it is doable, that's one message. The second thing is we've seen it happen. In, in Africa, we've seen the effects of the El Nino drought in 2016. And, and more droughts since then, really. And we can see the damage that's caused. But by developing the drought tolerant maize, we've been able to greatly increase the, the uh, ability of families to stay resilient in the face of drought. And you can see the young girl here uh, uh, showing how her family has grown the drought tolerant maize that was a partnership between the CGIR, US universities and US companies. Again, a great story and now being grown on over 12 million hectares, 6 million farm families and, and millions more benefiting in their communities and their countries. Now here's a great story of what's happened just in the last few years and Purdue University played a critical role in this partnership with the CGIR and with companies and national researchers in four South Asian countries. And in the space of four years, they have gone from, uh, and Corteva, I wanna mention Corteva as well. They have together developed heat tolerant maize and you can see the evidence there. And those heat tolerant mazes are now exceeding in performance the best commercial checks in that region. And you can see again, the impacts on the left and right of both in the plant stage, but also in the yield stage. And this is getting taken up by wildfire. This is, and it's only done in four years using genomic selection and big thanks to Professor Mitch Twinstra for helping make this possible. Finally, how do we bring this all together? It's really about, um, sustainably intensifying climate resilient production systems, where we go from these global challenges to local solutions that are integrated on the ground. And I think one of the things I'd like to leave you with is the inextricable linkage between what happens in food and agriculture systems, what happens in environment and biodiversity, and what happens with climate change. Those are inextricably linked and the success in our being able to achieve any of them well is interdependent. In other words, they depend on each other. And this is, I think, why we can be optimistic still about achieving the Sustainable Development Goal 2 to end hunger by 2030, to end undernutrition, to uh, sustainably help these hundreds of millions of small farm families who provide up to 80% of the food 
in the developing regions of the world. And, and, we, and at the same time, we can also contribute to the climate change goal and into the poverty eradication goal, the end of extreme poverty that accompanies things like child stunting and, and the uh, uh, terrible resource degradation that we see in so many parts of the world. It's been a great pleasure to be here and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you so much. Rob, that was fantastic. Thank you so much for your presentation and the time that you dedicated to uh, preparing that presentation and also for all of your work. Um, I would like to take a, a quick second as the moderator here to draw everybody's attention to the Q&A panel. And I would like to ask everybody to please join, uh, join that Q&A panel and, and, and send us questions along and along. Um, Rob, I see you on the uh, on the screen here. Uh, can I ask you one question, or do you, or will you indulge the moderator here? I mean, completely in your hands. Okay. Well, you mentioned that uh, increased availability of inputs such as water and fertilizer can greatly increase agricultural production. There are plenty of examples around the world where such inputs are used excessively and inappropriately. What are some approaches to encourage the appropriate use of those inputs? Thanks, Adam. No, that's a great point. And I was highlighting the situation in parts of Africa. We have different uh, situations in the world where in some parts of the world, including parts of say China, India, uh, Asia, we have overuse of inputs. And, and, and we, our big gains can come from using them much more efficiently. We can reduce emissions, we can save, uh, the energy that goes into producing them. In Africa, on the other hand, the challenge is degraded soils and they're low in organic matter, they're low in nutrients, and it's, it's a prescription for poverty and for, rather than sustainable intensification, just extensification that creeps into more and more land that probably should remain in trees or forests or wetlands. So in, in that part of the world, it's a matter of using judiciously the right kinds of, of nutrients combined with soil management practices that build organic matter, that build climate resilience, that, that actually sequester carbon. And I know Dr. Lau is going to say a lot more about this. So it's not one size fits all. There's gains in, on both ends of the spectrum that we can make by sound management of soil fertility and soil nutrients. Great answer. Okay, I can't wait to get to the Q&A to, uh, to, to get to Dr. Lal's response to that, but we have Dr. Lal's presentation to, to look forward to right now. So uh, without any more uh, questions at this point, again, please put your questions in the Q&A. And I have the, the honor of, of introducing Dr. Ratan Lal. He's a distinguished professor and director of the CFAES Dr. Ratan Lal Carbon Management and Sequestration Center at The Ohio State University. Ratan was the president of the Soil Society of America from 2006 to 2008 and the International Union of Soil Sciences from 2018 to 2019. Ratan, well, he researches soil carbon, soil carbon sequestration, food, climate security, conservation, agriculture, soil health. And he is pleased to be a member of the 2021 UN Food Security Summit Science Committee. Rattan has won just about every award in, uh, in his field. He has been selected as by Stanford University as the top 2% of the scientists globally. Uh, I could read off all the awards that Rattan has won, but but I would just say that he's pretty much won them all. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to turn the stage over to Dr. Rattan Law and ask him to maybe uh, build upon the great presentation that, that we heard and, and now move to Rattan's uh, presentation. I appreciate the opportunity to be a participant in the Global Agriculture Innovation Forum. I want to thank my friend, Dr. Eric Kuhneman and colleagues, Dr. Daryl Shiverly, 
Dr. Peter Hurst, Dr. John Dixon, Dr. Dennis Garrity, and of course the help received from Ms. Carol Brand. Greatly appreciated. Soil quality is a capacity of soil to function for specific land use within ecosystem boundaries. This is the NRCS definition. In the context of current issues, I have tried to define soil quality as a capacity of soil to generate ecosystem services in natural and managed ecosystems to produce net primary productivity, strengthen hydrological and biogeochemical cycles, moderate carbon sequestration in terrestrial ecosystems, and enhance human well being and nature conservancy. I would like to underline nature conservancy. In many definitions of soil quality, the nature protection, restoration, sustainable management, and its improvement is not mentioned, and it must always be. Human are part of nature. We benefit when nature benefits. Soil quality has four components, physical, chemical, ecological, and biological. It is the biological component of soil quality, which is called soil health. Indeed, soil is a living entity. 25% of all biodiversity lives in the top few centimeters of soil. Therefore, soil is a storehouse of life, gene pool, and germplasm. And when the soil biodiversity decreases below a critical level, ecosystem functions of the soil quality are also jeopardized. There's a strong connection, interaction, interconnectivity, nexus between life and soil quality, soil health. As Charles Kellogg said, there can be no life without soil and no soil without life. They have evolved together. I would like to go a step further to emphasize the importance of living things in soil because rhizosphere, the root soil interface at a nanoscale is the only place in the universe where the death is resurrected into life. Therefore, soil health can be defined as a soil's capacity, as a dynamic and biologically active entity within natural managed landscapes to sustain multiple ecosystem services, including net primary productivity, food and nutritional security, biodiversity, water purification and renewability, carbon sequestration, air quality and atmospheric chemistry, elemental cycling, both for human well-being and nature conservancy. Once again, nature is very important and should not be ignored either in soil quality or soil health. Comparing the two, soil quality and soil health, Soil quality is a quantitative measure of soil's capacity to perform its functions. In comparison, soil health is a qualitative measure. We are still trying to define indicators to quantify soil health. It's a soil biological properties and processes and is a descriptive explanation most of the time of ecosystem services that it can provide. However, we must strive, we must endeavor and improve our ability to quantify soil health. Why? Because the health of soil, plants, animals, human, environment, and the planetary process is strongly interconnected. When the health of soil goes down, the health of everything else goes down with it. Therefore, in addition to the socioeconomic factors, which are no doubt important, Food security research must also address environmental and resource management issues. It's not either or. We must produce more, but at the same time reconcile the need to produce more with the necessity to restore and improve the environment. Soil health can affect human health through positive effects, such as on micronutrients and strengthening the capacity of the soil to provide enriched food, and it can have negative effects such as nutrient imbalance, pathogens, toxic elements, some pollutants in the soil, and also soil can affect uh, directly the nutrient toxicants, antibiotic, healing pathogens, uh, agronomic yield, 
and indirectly, of course, water quality, air quality, biodiversity, disease suppressive soil. So soil health has a very, very strong impact on human health. Diet, which is strongly impacted by soil health and soil quality, uh, obviously in relation to human health, both in terms of uh, pollution, water quality and air quality, and the interaction between that, that lead to malnutrition, causing 2 billion plus people globally affected by malnutrition, in addition to 700 million by undernutrition, and the COVID-19 has increased the number of undernutrition by as much as 132 million by the end of 2020. Soil organic matter content is a key component, as I already mentioned, of soil health. It is the soil organic matter, its quality, quantity, and turnover that affects water quality and quantity, climate change, mitigation, adaptation, stabilization, food security, quantity and quality, and biodiversity, both above ground and below ground. Soil organic matter content is the heart of soil health. I can never overemphasize it. Sustainable management of soil, soil health and soil quality, both rests on several principles, replacing whatever is removed, responding wisely to whatever is changed, predicting what will happen from natural and anthropogenic changes, and producing more from less, saving land for nature. We are already using 5 billion hectare under agriculture, 1.5 billion hectare under cropland, 3.5 billion hectare under grazing land, pasture rainland. That is far too much. Maybe cropland can be reduced to 1 billion hectare, grazing land to 2 billion hectare. 3 billion hectare over time, we must try to achieve return the remaining 2 billion hectare back to nature. That's very important criteria. And how do we do it? Keep the soil continuously covered, minimize the disturbance, adopt integrated nutrient management based on biological nitrogen fixation, mycorrhiza, recycling, and so forth, and adopting complex rotations integrating crops with trees and livestock so that we can restore soil organic matter content by regenerative agriculture and eco-intensification. The strategy is to produce more and more from less and less, less external inputs, so that we can recycle and reduce the uh, losses into the environment, improve the use efficiency. A critical range, is very hard to define for soil organic matter content because of so many ecoregions, so many farming systems, so many soil types, so many cultures and tradition. But in general, somewhere between three and 4% of organic matter content in the root zone is a normal optimal range. Organic carbon content is about half of that, one and a half to 2%. And in most soils of the developing world, of the cropland region, the organic matter content is less than 0.5%. In fact, I do know soils of the Indo-Gangetic plains on both sides of the border are less than sometimes 0.1% organic matter content. And with that, the use efficiency of chemicals, energy, water, even the potential of improved germplasm cannot be realized. And that's a very important consideration. To improve soil quality and soil health, we must create a positive soil carbon budget. That's why carbon positive agriculture, carbon positive agriculture means the carbon going into the system, especially the soil, by practices such as biochar, compost, cover crop, roots, crop residue, is always more than the losses, such as erosion, leaching, and decomposition. Unfortunately, we always have our gains, uh, especially for the resource poor farmer, much less than the losses because of erosion, decomposition, harvesting of root crops, and so forth. We must reverse this general trend 
and increase the most carbon going into the soil, into the input by conservation agriculture, cover cropping, no-till, in integrated pest, nutrient, other management, and of course, complex crop preparation. If you have cover crop, which are biological nitrogen fixation because of legume and a lot of biomass input, that can also improve soil health. The strategy rather than NPK focus should be C and PK. C, carbon, organic matter content, going more into the soil, which will over time decrease the dependence on NPK. The cover crops can play a very important part. If we adopt agriculture practices in a proper prudent way, proven technologies, which I mentioned, conservation agriculture, cover cropping, uh, agroforestry, biochar, many things, uh, quite a lot of uh, improved technology available. The rate of carbon sequestration globally in the indo gangetic plain, about 300 to 400 kilogram per hectare per year. Sub-Saharan Africa, maybe 500. Uh, Brazil, another 400, 450. Uh, Brazil, where the cover crops can be grown over a long period of time, maybe as much as one to one and a half ton of carbon per hectare per year. And globally, definitely about 500 to 600 kilogram of carbon per hectare per year can be sequestered in soils of the world as organic carbon. In addition, there is also a possibility of sequestering inorganic carbon. If we were to increase soil organic carbon in the root zone by one ton per hectare, for the same management input, fertilizer, variety, extra, the yield of maize can be increased 100 to 300 kilogram per hectare. Soybean 20 to 50, wheat 20 to 70, rice 10 to 50, sorghum, millet, beans. In fact, crop yield can be increased globally from somewhere between 40 to 100 kilogram per hectare per year. If we can increase organic carbon by 10 ton, maybe over the next 15, 20 year period time, there will be a substantial increase in production, even with the same level of input, same level of land area, same level of irrigation, substantially, especially in developing countries of Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, Caribbean, and elsewhere. The technical potential of carbon sequestration in soil of the world is about two and a half gigaton per year, two and a half. Many people say that this can uh, offset the fossil fuel emission. No, fossil fuel emission last year was 10 gigaton. In addition, land use conversion also contributed one and a half gigaton. Out of 11 and a half, only about two and a half can be sequestered in soil under the most optimal condition, which do not exist at the present. Therefore, Soil carbon sequestration is important, but finding known carbon fuel sources is critical to mitigating the climate change. Please do not confuse. We can sequester in soil between now and 2100, almost 180 gigaton in forest biomass, afforestation at a very large scale, especially of degraded and depleted steep lands, another 150 gigaton together soil and forest until 2100, we have a technical potential and drawdown capacity of 150 to 160 parts per million CO2. But to offset anthropogenic emission completely by this system is not possible. Maybe 30%, maybe 20% realistic condition, maybe 15%. Therefore, finding known carbon fuel sources soon as soon as 2030, but definitely before 2050, is absolutely critical to limiting global warming to two degree and even perhaps realizing to one and a half degrees centigrade. The other important part is the land area and water resources which we are using by improving soil health. At the present, uh, we have about 700 million hectare of cropland under cereal. Over time, we must reduce it. We're using 200 million tons of fertilizer or by improving soil quality, soil health, we can reduce the input of chemical fertilizer. And yet we can increase crop yield from about three ton per hectare at the moment globally 
uh, to maybe as much as seven ton by the end of the century. The idea is use the best of the soil by best methods and save rest at least about 50% to nature, return it back to nature. Protection of soil quality can require thinking about stewardship, uh, economic incentive, legal approaches. All of those are important. Farming carbon, growing soil carbon as a farm commodity that can be traded, bought and sold, and create another income stream for farmer through payment for ecosystem services, somewhere between 40 to $60 per hectare, considering the price of about $130 per ton of carbon, and also considering rights of soil. Just as universal rights of human, rights of animal, there must also be rights of soil and rights of nature. Being the essence of all life, soil must have the rights to be protected, restored, thrived, and managed judiciously. I think this is a concept which is very important. Coming back to the payment for ecosystem services, about 120 to 130 dollar per ton of carbon. That's about 30 to 35 dollar, or maybe 25 euro per ton of CO2. Farmer can be compensated for half a ton of carbon sequestration per hectare for 65 dollar, or 26 dollar per acre, or for one third ton of carbon sequestration, about 40 dollar are about $18 per hectare. These payments are absolutely essential. Soil health is absolutely important in relation to all the ecosystem services. And that is what we call soil-centric program. The Green Revolution 2.0, soil-centric, based on soil health and soil quality. Of course, the varieties are important. Do not underestimate the value of varieties, but the good varieties can realize their potential only if grown on a healthy soil, not otherwise. Sub-Saharan Africa is a typical case and example. We have to have a conservation agriculture package. We have to IPM, INM, uh, drip subfertigation components together, crop residue management so that we don't burn it, cover cropping, complex rotation, and all of this glued together by prudent governance political willpower to translate science into action, words into deeds. And for that, the payment to farmer for ecosystem services is absolutely critical. Thank you for the opportunity to talk to you. Have a great meeting. Dr. Lal, thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. Uh, it's just fantastic to be on, on the panel with you. And uh, for our audience, it's very clear to see why uh, you, Dr. Lal, were selected as for the World Food Prize in 2020. Uh, very, very well uh, deserved. And we all appreciate the hard work that you have put into your life's efforts. Um, what I would like to do, I've been informed that we want to keep moving with the presentations. And then I have a question for you, but we'll... I'll catch it in the question and answer, if that's all right. Okay. And um, to our audience, and I would like to encourage you, don't forget to put your questions in the Q&A box. We, we see a few of them flowing in, and we appreciate it. So now we're very blessed to have uh, Dr. M. Al Yat. Uh, he's a principal scientist and uh, systems agronomist in, in, um, in the International Maize and Wheat Improvement Center based in India. He has served on the Indian Council of Agricultural Research as a systems agronomist for 11 years prior to joining CMET. Um, Dr. Yacht has devoted two decades to intensively working on basic applied science in agronomy. And he wants to focus his, he has focused his career and his, his publications on soils, the environment, and promoting conservation agriculture based on sustainable intensification and climate smart agriculture for smallholders of land, land and small farmers in Asia. His significant uh, research in outputs and capacity building and policy communications have led to uh, multiple impacts for 
the small holders and um, in South Asia. He's a fellow of the National Academy of Agricultural Sciences. Dr. Yai has several awards and recognitions to his credit. Uh, the most prestigious being the Rafi Ahmed Kidwai Award of 2018. And that, but he has several other awards to his name and he's going to provide us with a, a very insightful presentation. And um, once again, don't forget to put your questions in the Q&A box. So with that, I'm gonna hand the floor over to Dr. Yat. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thanks uh, for uh, this opportunity uh, to share some of our uh, experience on uh, adapting agricultural systems to the effect of climate change uh, towards farms and, and farmers of the future, uh, especially in South Asia. And we all know that South Asia is a region of challenges because of uh, the population density. It's uh, one of the most vulnerable regions uh, for climate change and uh, we have the natural resources are under pressure. So, at the same time, we should also be mindful of uh, future challenges, not only today's challenges to produce uh, more nutritious food from the less resources and that to the degraded resources and having the complexity of the climatic variability. So adapting our agricultural systems to the effect of climate change in smallholder uh, systems of South Asia need innovations. But when we talk about innovations and uh, you know doing innovations, we should not be undermining the power of smallholder farmers and the innovations should not be thought of uh, from the perspective of the size of the farms, rather from a business model having win-win for all. So we need business unusual approaches and innovations which contribute to the local priorities for building resilience to the climatic risks and also to contribute to global priorities such as sustainable development goals. Also, for securing the future of South Asian farms and farmers, we need both technological and institutional innovations. And when we talk about techn technological innovations, we know that there has been a lot of advancement in technologies, but uh, I would like to uh, use some of the examples of innovations which addresses the key challenges of sustainability and climate change. And to start with, one of the major challenge is water. And, uh, you know, not only in South Asia, but across the globe. But when we talk about India, India is maximum user of the fresh water from the aquifer. So it is one of the major challenge. And to address some of those, uh, you know, challenges, uh, I cite the example, you know, some of the examples and to start with, the laser assisted precision lead lambda. Now look at uh, this picture. Uh, this is uh, an excellent example of innovation with impact at a scale. Though it's a costly and knowledge intensive technological innovation, but it's still extensively used by the smallholder farmers. This is one of the perfect example of technology led business model. And one of the best examples of for the farmers investments of uh, you know us dollar 500 million in a technology without any incentive for water saving it has been adopted over 7 million hectares and there are 45000 farmer service providers especially the youth and we save you know every year 10 kilometer cubes of water and this is one of the best examples of a climate smart agriculture practice now look at uh, you know this uh, climate smart landscape with the uh, precision land leveling close to Professor Ratan Lal's native village in India and having a very minimal variability, you can see the fields which are contributing to the efficiency and lowering the environmental footprint. So innovations can have impact at the landscape. Now the another you know, challenge what we are facing is the soil health and also the air pollution which led to the human health issues and increased cost of production. So altogether those challenges are complicated. Whereas uh, the crop residue burning, if I take the example, you know, leading to the air pollution, which is increasing the medical bills of the people to the tune of US dollar 2 billion every year in indo gangetic plain states alone. And to, to address those issues, uh, there has been a lot of work uh, in, on uh, technologies like Happy Cedar or technological innovations like Happy Cedar, but it took us 
a decade and a half to an you know to cite an example as why continued investments are needed for refinement enhanced capacity and science evidence based policy informing uh, for a needed last mile delivery uh, look at uh, this picture which is indicating how the efforts of different donors continued effort of different donors you know starting from SEIR USAID Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation government of india and others and the institutions involved like uh, punjab agriculture university indian council of agriculture research cement rice with consortium and several manufacturers that have played the key role for an impact at scale and uh, and and and, and uh, you know look at this uh, you know innovation which is uh, really great but uh, in the process of uh, you know many a time those quick fixes of the challenges there are there are chances of bad innovations as well and you can you can look at this example you know of the happy cedar versus the roto cedar under an event of the extreme climatic risk of un untimely heavy rains and both innovations you know were done uh, for residue management objectives but under a risk the crop is adversely impacted due to roto cedar because of the lower infiltration rates whereas happy cedar the crop is happy the farmer is happy so the innovations uh, you know should be such which are good under the good seasons but should be very good under the bad seasons now the third example i would like to cite is uh, you know abiotic stresses especially heat and water stress uh, which which are uh, you know which are the greatest challenges uh, you know under climate change now that needs systemic innovations and innovations for exploring windows of opportunity through integrating the stress resilient crop varieties and innovative ag agronomic management practices and uh, you can see you know this uh, you know picture where you can see where are the windows of opportunity through these integrations so introduction of the short duration high yielding rice varieties for water saving coupled with stress tolerant high yielding varieties of wheat with conservation agriculture that led to advancing the wheat seeding by almost 15 days in 1 million hectares of northwest india and you can see the progressive adoption from starting from 2017 to 2019 uh, which is phenomenal and uh, almost uh, similar acreage in eastern uh, you know gangetic plain of south asia and uh, that on, not only helped in saving water but uh, using uh, the so residual soil moisture but also in buffering the heats and lowering the environmental footprints and increasing the wheat yields by half a ton per hectare and the farmers profit uh, you know to the tune of us dollar 200 per hectare uh, in per season and that's that's one of the best examples of how systemic innovations can build the resilience against the climatic risks now in 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 addition to 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 the technological innovations we need uh, you know institutional innovations especially for last mile delivery markets and business models and i'll set some examples here you know for last mile delivery of any technology uh, to the farmers need a pull factor rather than a classical push and i, I think uh, you know this need institutional and market innovations through appropriate policy reorientation and one example you know that could uh, be on incentivizing carbon farming rather than subsidy for everything which is uh, ongoing and i think that's one of the major problem and i'm happy to say that uh, you know there are already you know high level discussions on moving towards carbon farming in the region so so that that needs institutional innovation now there another one uh, which is creating business models and uh, for that we need discovery to delivery continuum bringing all the key actors uh, you know together including public private and civil society uh, but that need institutional innovation now the third one uh, is uh, you know when we talk about institutional innovation uh, for for investment decision that must focus on portfolio practices rather than commodity or component technology and we need uh, you know we need to address the the issues of or challenge of food energy and water nexus and uh, hence there is a need for reorienting investments on portfolios of practices as packages uh, rather than you know single commodity and you can you can look at this picture wherein conservation agriculture coupled with subsurface drip fertigation and solar farms is one of the best examples that can solve the multiple challenges in intensive rice wheat systems of igp without any additional investment but just uh, need the smart use of the investment for institutional innovation so uh in summary 
for adapting uh, the agricultural systems to the effect of climate change, our farms and farmers of the future need to be supported by both technological and institutional innovations. And the, the, the examples I, I, I have cited can clearly indicate that with uh, innovations, we can better adapt to the agriculture systems to the effect of climate change. I'll, uh, I'll be happy uh, to discuss further on, on such innovations. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, for 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 uh, patients hearing and this opportunity. Thank you very much, Dr. Jat. I really appreciate your your focus on uh, the happy cedar and happy farmers. Right, that's really that's critically important for for us is to have. Well, what you said is the use it, utilizing the happy cedar, utilizing new technology, but also having happy farmers, and then. The other topic that you brought up that I found quite interesting <clears throat> was the use of global farm subsidies to uh, address climate change and, and, and carbon farming. And I think there was uh, a, an OECD report that said uh, global farm subsidies are around $530 billion a year. Um, so that's, that's a lot of money that could be used to, to as you mentioned, for, uh, for carbon farm planning in the globe. But, um, but I'd like to hold all the other questions. Again, emphasize that, that please submit your questions in the Q&A. And I'm ready to turn now to our, our last uh, but not least speaker. And we're gonna go to a different region of the, country, of the world here. And we're gonna go down to Brazil where uh, Dr. Paulo Cavallo is going to give us a, a, a really good presentation on, on some integration of animals. And he's a, he's a discipline leader on grazing ecology at the research group at the Federal University of Rio Grande do, do, do Sul in Brazil. He's uh, currently a full professor at, at the, in, on the faculty of the agronomy, and he's been working there since 1997. Paulo was a visiting scientist at the AGP division of FAO for the theme on integrated crop livestock systems and coordinator of the Animal Science Advisory Committee on the National Council for Science and Technology Development. He's a member of the Committee on Low Carbon Agriculture and the chair of the Intelligence Board of Intelligent Services, Intelligence Service in Agribusiness, SIA. Paulo is a uh, director of Brazilian Society of Animal Production, president of the Brazilian Society of Integrated Crop and Livestock Systems, and director of ICLS Alliance, a public-private uh, par partnership. Um, so with that, I would like to uh, hand, and Paulo has also received a number of awards. So we have a uh, a, a very esteemed panel. He, he won the Futuro da Terra medal for his achievements in Brazil. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Paulo to tell us a little bit about integrating livestock into uh, cropping systems and how the, the production may uh, in, be enhanced in that. I'm Paulo Carvalho. I'm a professor from the uh, Federal University of Southern Brazil. And um, first of all, I would like to thank the organizing committee for this invitation that uh, really hon honored me. I hope to present to you how the recoupling of crops and animals can recover landscape uh, multifunctionality and resilience, being a way forward climate smart farming. Let's do a brief introduction of the alliance that is uh, responsible by all knowledge I will share with you today. Um, in addition to my position in the, in the university, I am, I am the director of a non-profit organization that uh, assembles public universities and the private sector. We get together to foster sustainable intensification using integrated crop livestock systems as the main uh, technological pillar aiming to design sustainable food production systems. Concerning research initiatives, we have seven long-term experiments, some of which will be used in this presentation to illustrate integrated crop livestock systems benefits. We have been working in a research community uh, that believes that modern uniform 
agriculture is more and more disconnected from nature. The separation of crops and livestock is just one of the signals. Highly intensive systems based on high inputs and specialization have produced landscapes functionally poor. This picture illustrates rice paddy fields as an example of very intensive specialized crops. In Brazil or in Japan, during a large period, these areas remain uncovered. Crop farmers produce only one commodity per year, and a huge loss of diversity is the consequence of these uh, very uniform landscapes. Other consequences, the disruption of uh, biogeo biogeochemical cycles is amplified by nitrogen and phosphorus uh, and manage flows in addition to loss of uh, diversity are the most visible side effects of modern agriculture. So this uh, agricultural pattern must be changed. We are challenged to create a sustainable food future producing uh, with less area, producing more food with less area and less environmental impacts. This uh, smart farming is not an easy task, but we believe that integrated crop livestock systems can truly be useful as a rare option to conciliate production and conservation. So what we propose? We propose the recoupling of crops and livestock as a measure to recover landscape diversity and multifunctionality. In this uh, recent paper, we describe these trends in South America. The Rio de la Plata region comprises central Argentina, Uruguay, and southern Brazil. Recent decades have been characterized by the advance of cropping areas over native grasslands. Highly specialized agriculture has decoupled crop and livestock production, but has succeeded in intensifying yields. However, significant losses of ecosystem services have been reported. So we propose alternatives to redesign multifunctional landscapes based on integrated crop livestock systems. So let's move to present evidences of how integrated crop livestock systems can provide the basis for a climate smart agriculture. Let's move to the first example, producing more food in the same unit of land with less inputs. This paper of our research group illustrates how integrated systems are more efficient in nutrient use. In non-grazed cover crops in the right, the protein production is only from soybean, and it takes 250 kilograms of calcium, 80 kilograms of magnesium, and 75 kilograms of potassium to produce one ton of edible um, protein, while in integrated systems, the protein produced comes from soybean and steers, taking less nutrients to produce the same amount of edible protein per hectare because of nutrient cycling promoted by the recoupling of animals. This, um, Sorry, this example uh, concerns uh, rice paddy fields. The first column um, is the traditional um, rice monoculture. The third column is a season in which uh, we rotate rice with soybean and rye grass grazed by steers. In the same unit of land, the integrated systems produce 66% more edible protein per hectare than the traditional one. Uh, just remember that humanity uh, must produce 56% um, more food till uh, 2050. Now let me present another important feature of these systems. This paper from my PhD student brings evidence of long-term stability when livestock was recoupled to soybean monoculture. Using a 16-year data set, we suggest that yield resistance and stability are improved by the presence of the grazing animal. In red is the pure crop systems. 
the others are integrated systems in different grazing intensities, meaning soil heights. These are the data for the, of the previous figure. One can notice that mean human digestible protein production and profitability of the systems, of grazing systems, are higher than the ungrazed cover crop systems. More than that, the difference in years experiencing draw are much higher if you see in the minimum, um, in the minimum yield column. In other words, livestock is the component uh, responsible uh, to this to stabilize the system. In this example, in this paper, uh, we worked with researchers from UC Davis and CSIRO under simulated future climate conditions, a uh, scenario from 2020 to 2060. Uh, integrated system productivity exceeded specialized system productivity in 95% of the years, despite declines in the average soybean yield and cover crop biomass production due to uh, climate change. So if integrated crop livestock systems are important to stabilize pure crop systems, this feature will be even more important in the future. So let's move to, now to evidences of greenhouse gas mitigation. Concerning carbon, in this review, a colleague of mine shows the increase in carbon stocks from integrated systems in different soil types and cropping systems all around Brazil. No till in green, which is already a good technique for stocking carbon, uh, is boosted by the recoupling uh, of grazing animals, which are in blue, integrated crop livestock systems. So integrated crop livestock systems using no-till is even more successful in improving soil carbon in many different locations. As grazing is so important on these landscapes, just a few words to say we have been developing a concept in grazing management, an innovation called rotatinous stocking, which is a blend of words, of the words continuous and rotational. This is a concept based on animal behavior that we use it to manage grazing on natural, pure zone or pastures integrated with crops. In these examples of these two papers, we bring evidence of decreasing methane emissions per unit animal production. Rotatinous stocking can decrease methane emissions by 50% when expressed in terms of live weight gain, or 72% when, when expressed in terms of carcass. And it is worth mentioning that Embrapa has important initiatives proposing trees as a component of integrated systems which increases the diversity of these systems as, as well as the potential to, uh, to stock carbon. To conclude, let's present our most important extension project called PISA, which is the acronym for Integrated Crop Livestock Systems uh, in Portuguese. Uh, in this project, we work with family farmers putting in practice the redesign of agricultural landscapes and uh, we make the transition of to climate smart farming. Well, PISA is a model of blended intensification frameworks aiming at agricultural development and sustainability. Integrated crop livestock systems is the pillar, of course, but we use other techniques to make the transition to smart farm, um, working uh, directly uh, with, um, with our communities. Family farmers are, uh, of course, our main public. On average, they have small areas around 18 hectares and milk around 14 uh, uh, cows that produce 13 liters a day uh, per cow based on silage and concentrate. Pastures usually makes less than 30% of the cow's diet. One of our aims in redesigning the system is to make pastures provide more than 60% of the cow's diet, introducing diversity in the forage and crop metrics as well as a decrease in inputs per unit of milk products produced. We have a non-published data showing increases in milk production by 60%, increases in organic matter, and demonstrating the decrease in the vulnerability of the systems to external prices and inputs. 
We have already reached 1,800, 19 family farms with this approach. And now this PISA program is recognized as a benchmark in Southern Brazil. So let's finish with an example with data of the consequences of the transition to smart farming promoted by the PISA initiative. We use this tool from FIO, the SAFA, Sustainability Assessment of Food and Agriculture Systems, which evaluate, evaluate all the different dimensions of sustainability. We have just submitted this paper with results from 79 farms evaluated. At the end of the four year project, the PISA approach based on the pillar of integrated crop livestock systems was successful in promoting all dimensions of sustainability and increasing gross margins of family farmers by 79%. Despite the many benefits of integrated crop livestock systems as a pillar to smart farming, it's not an easy path. In general, humans don't like complex systems. They are difficult to manage, difficult to understand, and difficult to explain even more if you are a non-native English speaker. Thank you very much. I'm really glad about the opportunity to share our thoughts in this forum. Please consider me as just a representative of a huge bunch of persons producing the knowledge I presented. Thanks for your patience. That was a great presentation, Paulo. Your spider diagram tied right back into Rob. So I appreciate the way that the whole panel worked together and delivered uh, the challenge of a lifetime, I think it is. And that is, uh, that's gonna tie into the first question. And so Dr. Professor Lal, I'd like to start with you and move through our panel in a sequential way. And then um, Dr. Yacht, I'll come to you with the next question. These are, I'm gonna to try to keep my questions. I'd like you to keep your answers to less than two minutes. And that way we have a lot of questions flowing in. So uh, Dr. Lal, and, and this question is gonna go across to the whole panel. <clears throat> You introduced a concept that, that built on what Rob said, which was carbon positive agriculture. Carbon positive agriculture builds upon a net carbon neutral agriculture. So we go to uh, net zero emissions and then we go to a net positive. And we all know that the forestry and agricultural sectors are unique and then they can move carbon out of the atmosphere. Some of the other industry and, and, and energy uh, can get to net zero maybe, but we actually have something to go in the, in the opposite direction. So as we move toward a net carbon neutral and then a net carbon positive global agricultural sector, how do small landholders who may not have full title participate in both uh, in, in the healthy soils efforts and any beneficial projects or market type mechanisms that may come along. Um, so two minutes, if I can keep everybody to about a two minute answer, I know that's a tough one, but I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, estimated about uh, a billion small landholders around the world. So they are very critical to food production and achieving sustainable, not having land rights tenure uh, is not a very good incentive for them to invest in land. So land tenure is very, very critical. Hopefully it can be addressed wherever it is not the case. Uh, but with assuming that land tenure uh, exists, then the farmer should be compensated for restoring soil health through carbon sequestration according to what we talk about payment for ecosystem services. Uh, and uh, so land tenure, yes, is very important. Uh, I want to say very briefly, uh, carbon positive agriculture and carbon neutral. Many times people say carbon neutral agriculture. If carbon neutral means whatever we produce uh, should be enough to offset what our carbon we are adding, for heaven's sake, no, <laughs> you can't feed the world. So we have to produce a lot more carbon in output than we are adding into the system. And that is the carbon positive. That's what I would call eco-intensification idea of improving the use for which soil health is very critical. 
in both cases, uh, land tenure systems are very important. So that farmers have motivation to invest in empowering farmers, having pro-farmer policies and pro-agriculture policies. That would be a brief answer. Wonderful, thank you. And, and you left 30, 30 seconds on the table. So that, that's gonna give us, and we may have a little more time. We may actually go an additional 10 minutes because we have a lot of questions coming in. So Dr. Yacht, I'll bring the same question to you. Um, small holders of land and they're able to utilize some technology and innovation. I guess I, what I've taken from your presentation is technology may help these small holders become more productive, but then on the soil carbon side of things, uh, can they also become a little more focused in their nutrient use as, as Rob talked about uh, early in the, in, in the, in the presentation, in his presentation. Dr. Yacht, yeah, yeah. you have any thoughts? Um, thank you, thank you. Um, I think, uh, you know, when we talk about the small old farmers in terms of the nutrient use, they are more smart than the large farmers. They are more efficient than the large farmers. And uh, there are several examples of uh, the small old farmers making better use of uh, the nutrients. And uh, if we do the better management practices, I think that uh, helps in building the carbon and also reducing the emissions. But I think, uh, the, the, the policies, as I indicated, uh, is something very, very important. The flat rate ad hoc uh, uh, system is not going to help the smallholder farmers. And that's where, as Professor Lal have indicated, uh, Rob have indicated, everyone is talking about carbon farming. We have to get rid of the subsidy business, subsidies for inefficiency. We have to go towards incentives for efficiency. And that incentive for efficiency takes us towards carbon positive farming. I think uh, if we really want to help these smallholder farmers, we need to take out the subsidy and go towards efficiency and payment for efficiency. That's uh, the answer, the, the short answer I would like to give at this stage. Great, I think that's a very interesting perspective. The, the, it's it's really if I understood you correctly the redirection of money, and that's 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 not subsidizing inefficiency. It's actually subsidizing efficiency, which is is ties into Dr. Law's uh, recommendation that we have to do more with less. Right? Is is that what I understood from you? Yes. 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 Or even 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 as I said, we need not to put extra money whatever money is going for the farmers in terms of subsidy, if we channelize that money and make better use of the money, I think that can help environment, that can help soil, that can help the smallholder farmers and everyone. Wonderful, thank you. And that ties directly over to Dr. Carvalho's. Uh, my question for Dr. Carvalho is a, it's the exact same question. We're talking small landholders here, small operations, as you've highlighted in your in your presentation, um, how do you see the integration of livestock on small parcels helping to uh, enhance soil carbon stocks, reduce emissions? Uh, you know, some would argue that economies of scale are 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 the are are a way to go, but um, but we all know the lifeblood of our world is the small farmer. So, uh, uh, Dr. Cavallo, can I hand that over the question over to you? Thank you, Dr. Chambers. Yes, uh, in in the example that I showed you, uh, our small farmers, uh, when we start the uh, the PISA initiative, um, the lands are very poor in soil organic matter, for example, and we start with a man of many technological pathways, as I, as I showed you. And we have a, a data on a, about 300 farmers in which uh, we uh, show an increase of about a half percent in soil organic matter per year during the four uh, years of the, um, of, the, um, of the project. So uh, small farming, they, they start all the process with a higher level of diversity compared to larger farms, you know. 
Uh, and then you have a, a much more options to manage uh, nutrient flows in the, um, in the small farming. The point is, uh, normally uh, the, the sectors or the components in these, in these small farms, they are not connected. Um, and the um, dairy, for example, the, the crop area, the silage, the, the porks, they are not connected. So what we try to do uh, with the, um, the consultancy uh, is to uh, to think the the this uh, small property in a holistic way, you know, in a system systemic way, uh, trying to think about all the uh, cycling in in that small uh, um, farm and the the concept of uh, cycling nutrients in integrated crop livestock systems. This is one of the pillars in the in the proposal of integrated crop livestock systems. So we have been uh, experiencing uh, success, I would say, uh, in managing much more, uh, which means um, a decrease in the vulnerability of these small farms and increasing, um, increasing the, uh, the production um, with decreasing external inputs in these small farms. So this is the lesson learned from, from, from the PISA initiative. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very good. Uh, so, Dr. Bertram, I'm going to turn now to you. We've prepared, uh, essentially, we've tied back into uh, NPK inputs and reduction of inputs. Um, Dr. Lal has an interesting addition there that I think is very meritorious, which is it's C NPK. So, we've got now for um, nutrients that we need to manage for, and we need to precisely manage for those. But what's your perspective from USAID in the, in, in the role that USAID can have working with small farmers, ranchers to uh, implement these practices on different levels of, of land ownership, if you might. So um, it's, it's, it's a tough question. But I'd love to hear the perspective from USAID. Thank you very much, Adam. And I, I think Dr. Lal has laid before us one of the great challenges of our time in terms of looking at soil with the C being just as important as the NPK in terms of how we manage. So what I would say is I emphasized our focus on trying to provide choices and opportunities, better choices for farmers to make a, a wider set of options. Um, I think we've many of those options hinge around the idea of finding smallholder friendly ways to capitalize undercapitalized systems. And that can be anything from like a picks bag, a storage bag uh, that allows farmers to preserve their crop and, and, and save it to when prices are better and, and reduce losses to uh, small scale irrigation, small scale mechanization. Dr. Jot talked about that. In Asia, we've seen the tremendous uh, 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 effect of service provision provided capitalization of land management and, and soil management and so forth. Uh, in Africa, that's just beginning. And what I would say is, so along with our emphasis on things like small scale irrigation, small scale mechanization through private partnerships that helps aggregate markets and drives investment, I would posit that we also need to think about soil as a capital good. In other words, we have to think about some longer term investments in soil. And in Africa, we do have a different situation. It's more like what Brazil faced 40 years ago, uh, less than what, less like the very good soils that are, are found in South Asia that support tremendous uh, populations. So here it's a matter of using more resources using them more efficiently, avoiding the mistakes that have been made elsewhere, and integrating all these practices around greater coverage of the soil during the year, uh, uh, more biomass in the system. Big challenge for us is biomass for soil versus biomass for livestock. But we can. But this is the kind of thing we can solve. We need to be sharing lessons learned from all over the world on how to uh, help these systems move towards a a sustainable, 
uh, uh, carbon uh, balanced and uh, uh, but but also a, a livelihoods outcome, food security outcome future. Great, thank you, Rob. I appreciate that. Uh, now, in um, in in sequence here, I, I guess I would like to go to to Dr. Dr. Jot next. And I would like to ask you um, a very specific question, and, and that is uh, that is you you have a very strong opinion on uh, some of the the redirection of of global finance, if you might. Um, and I'll, I'll cascade this through the whole panel. Um, I think that's I, I agree with you in in, in your your opinion there. The question that I wanted to bring to you in specific is how do we get uh, the private sector involved? How do we mobilize a public-private partnership to bring about the change? Uh, you know, for example, the happy cedar that I saw and then the, the transition to happy farmers. How do we uh, work with, within government? but also work within in uh, leveraging public-private partnerships to deliver uh, for the farmers what they need, when they need it, both in a mitigation perspective and also in an adaptation resilience perspective. Thanks, uh, I think that's a, that's a great question. I think uh, there is no way we can uh, alone with the government system can achieve what we would like to achieve. Uh, private sector's involvement is very, very important. And, uh, you know, they are already, you know, working uh, here and there, but I think more of inclusivity of the private whole process is something important. And uh, when we talk about the private sector, we should not forget the business model. We have to have the business model in place. And when we talk about business model, the government's priorities can be made. The government is happy. The farmer's priorities can be made. The farmer is happy. And also the private sector's business uh, you know, priorities are made. The, the, the private sector is happy. There are a whole lot of opportunities around for bringing all those puzzles together and making the business models and business cases. And there are, there are examples. And the example I cited, the laser land leveling you know, in India, when we introduced it, you know, you know, all the people were asking the question, this is a sophisticated technology. This is a costly technology. Our farmers are small and there is no incentive for water saving. Who will adopt it? But I think farmers have shown the way and the level of investment, the private investment. And when we talk about the private sector, it's not the private business players, but farmer is also a private sector you know, entity. And uh, they have put a lot of money around. And now I see a lot of, lot of uh, you know, uh, interest of the private sector, even in, on the carbon farming we are dealing with, and uh, we in Sinemet have you know, already entered into the agreements with the Grow Indigo, for example, for moving towards carbon farming, you know, talking with the Indian Council of Agriculture Research. There are others, Pair Crop Science have put their agenda for 2030 to move towards uh, carbon neutral or carbon positive farming systems, and we are partnering with them. So the private sector interest is there and they are coming forward. But I think we should not look private sector from the perspective like a you know input provider or something. We we need to have the inclusivity and we need to have the ownership. And that's that that takes us towards a perfect business model, which is not explored, you know, you know, largely. I think we need to explore uh, you know bringing all those together from a business perspective. Great. Okay. All right. So, Dr. Carvalho, I, I'm going to move straight to you. I appreciate that uh, perspective on public-private partnerships. Now, I'm going to bring in a little bit of a challenge, which is uh, which is in, in the integrated systems that you've highlighted. Um, we know that animals have, you know, enteric methane emissions. We um, we also sometimes see economies of scale. How can um, you know small landholders both participate uh, and 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 then the other on the flip side we've seen amp grazing in these intensive management systems that that actually do a lot of benefit to uh, to to the to the soil health and the and the environmental health upon which they're they're managed. So um, my question for you is is a very 
a brief one is uh, is how can the the small holders of animal agriculture participate in in a world that also has very large entities participating? Well, uh, uh, in Brazil, uh, small holders um, represents uh, almost eight percent of the of the farms. You know. So it's, um, it's a huge people working on, on small farm. And uh, I guess that the, with the proposal of um, integrating or recoupling crops and livestock, and in the study case that I presented, um, decreasing the need for silage and concentrates and increasing the use of um, uh, of pastures in the cow's diet, we can sequester carbon by using better the pasture and decreasing uh, the externalities, the need of uh, in external inputs in the in the small farm. So this is a, a there is a lot of cascade effects that I cannot show you, uh, could not show you in in, in my presentation regarding uh, the the amelioration in the soil, um, decreasing uh, in the, the methane emission per unit of animal product. So uh, if you consider the large, um, the large number of families in Brazil oh. and worldwide, um, if this proposal uh, can uh, also be applied in Asia or in Africa, for example, I would say that uh, small farming has a huge um, possibility to contribute in the um, in the climate change um, issue. Wonderful. Uh, to the whole audience, I'd like to say thank you. I'd like to say thank you to the panelists. Uh, I'd like to say thank you to Purdue. Uh, we, I've just been informed we're out of time. We could go for another hour easily. And uh, Dr. Lal, we want to fulfill the vision that you have for this world. But, um, and I've got a whole bunch of questions that I could ask about the, the for, for every panelist. But what I'd like to do is, uh, is I started with a round of applause. Let's see. There's the round of applause for, for my panelists and for Purdue University. Thank you all uh, very much. And, um, and I look forward to our time when we're together. I, I wish everybody health and safety. Uh, and then I would also in wrap up, I'd like to alert everybody of the March 23rd, uh, um, next, the, the upcoming next forum on, on and it's gonna focus um, on, on transformational technologies and how farmers and, and farms can enable uh, transformation technologies and adopt innovation. So we heard a little bit of that today. There's a whole lot more to come on March 23rd and I'd like to bring that to everybody's attention. And uh, in the wrap up, I'd like to just say, be safe everyone and a heartfelt thank you for your time today. <laughs>